Yeah, we'll start developing in a second. We're currently on this EG noise removal thing. Just in the project itself, move it up at the top. And just so it's clear uh, what was updated uh, last. This change is obviously not in production yet. So yes, that's the old thing that we had. We had some videos on it, but uh, unfortunately it doesn't work anymore. Uh, that's why we are redoing this. Um, it used to be LabVIEW, now it's Python. NumPy, SciPy, Pandas. Uh, and it kind of, yeah, it looks same, same, but different. This is what it uh, currently, this is going to be, what, this is what it's going to look like. Hopefully we can publish it today so we can have something to play with. Um, yeah, just quickly checking. This is a bit weird, but... Uh, yeah, this toggle button is nice. Uh, levels. Right, you can barely see its effect. So yeah, if it's level, be able to go all the way down to zero. Yeah, so that's the original signal, and the noisy one uh, next to it. There's a kind of natural uh, DC uh, in it. So when you hit uh, the trending, the almost uh, overlaid one top of another. Yeah, you kind of see the noise there at the back. Uh, some of these wavelets will be doing more than others. Yeah, there's not really much difference between them. Uh, these two things don't work. I get a 400 error at the server. Uh, we'll have to fix that. We'll probably have to describe properly, make a prompt, proper prompt. So we can actually fix it. Let's start populating. Uh, yeah, let's start uh, with the HTML file. Oops. Is this the same? file right that's the no that's okay can okay, close that so we have the HTML popped into ChatGPT and we have that line that was working quite successful this no where is it Yeah, confirm reading the code to not generate anything else. Uh, this bit is handy because normally it should respond with. I've read the HTML code you provided. It appears to be a web page for visualizing EEG, electroencephalogram. Data with various controls for data processing and visualization. That's right. So thanks for confirming that. Uh, then next, let's pop in the JavaScript. And the same uh, prompt, but just reading, not generating anything else. I've read the code, that's great. 
it's kind of it feels like it is important in what uh, order uh, this is done uh, let's do a CSS as well on theme reading don't generate anything else I've read and understood okay it's giving itself uh, human-like properties which is a bit odd but whatever works and the last snippet of code is the Python Flask application right so this switch now Ooh. yeah the switch does work it's the number of levels it's going all the way to zero Alt is five. That's okay. And let's start with something simple. Change the trend into a toggle switch. Chapter four, yes, yes. Let's see if it understands the context. It does. That's not very helpful because you can copy the code when you have before and after. Uh, we have the trend and HTML. Uh, do we? It's actually called the trend toggle. It's already a toggle. We're replacing the whole thing. I guess so. Right, now it doesn't have the label. Uh, what else in the... In the flask code you provided, you're already reading the trend parameter from the request, which will be true if the checkbox, now toggle switch, is checked and will be missing if it's not checked. Right, so we're actually checking for the, the ID for it is the trend toggle. And not the trend... Actually, it is the trend. How is it even working at all if the... Okay, I see what's the trend. Yes, that's the same. This means no change is required in the back-end code since you're already handling it correctly. Note, ensure that the CSS code for the toggle switch, which you previously provided, is included in the index, HTML file, or any link star sheets so the toggle switch will be styled correctly. Uh, okay, now the only problem. It's not actually working, I guess because of the name. Is this name used in JavaScript? It should be just the trend, is it? Right, now it's uh, working. Yeah, just leave it as is, which is need the label. A checkbox, the trend switch. We have another switch. 
expand wherever the noise goes on top there. Have the trend as name. Right, that's working fine. Right, we wanted to later we'll uh, rearrange uh, the whole uh, the whole thing. Uh, let's see, log. Lock can be changed to a button, I don't like the drop downs. No, that can stay as is for now. And right. Okay, we're ready. If everything is. working we can uh, publish this which are we let me know what you think are we ready to publish uh, i would say yes if everything is functioning There's still a problem with that. Yeah, replace the chair. Let's go through this for a sec. The effect of the noise is not very clear, but it's there, but not very clear. Okay, that's the, just the way it is. Effect of uh, world trust was not clear. Can all spin buttons be replaced by. Uh, Spin buttons replaced by sliders. Check boxes replaced by toggle switches. All oh, right, we got about this one. Uh, let's pop this in. Uh, so we want to make sure signal to noise ratio is now and mean square error uh, showing actual values. To show the signal to noise ratio, SNR, and mean square error, MSE, for the EEG data, you need to calculate and return these values from the back end and then display them in the front end. Uh, here's how we do it. Modify the get underscore data route to calculate and return the SNR and MSE values. Okay, we're using from SK learn metrics import mean underscore squared underscore error. Uh, okay. It's funny how GitHub Copilot works. It's uh it's already imported mean square error. And from math it's trying to import square root. Well we don't really need it, do we? Uh, Okay, now get that. Uh, what is this thing called? Anyway? Oops. This input will be called from the client side to get the data. Uh, okay. Rest of the code is an calculation. Do I have anything as in uh, at the moment? No. So at the end of this function, which is getting ridiculously long, so I suspect later will be really hard to troubleshoot if there are any problems. Uh, we're doing this bit. Hash S N R calculation signal underscore power equals NP. Mean original underscore eg underscore data asterisk asterisk two noise underscore power equals NP. Mean original underscore eg underscore data eg underscore data asterisk asterisk 2 snr equals 10 asterisk n hash mse calculation mse equals mean underscore squared underscore error original underscore eg underscore data eg underscore data 
hash prepare the response response underscore data equals raw underscore signals original underscore signal denoised underscore signal spectrums spectrums snr snr mse mse right so we have to didn't tell us but we need to replace it uh, we don't need this one anymore SNR square root is it okay and eg data the filter the EG so it should be legit oh yes that's min square error let's get it's not getting much information can I scope pilot explain this yeah using SK learn metrics to input arrays, the original and the filtered one, the mean square error is a measure of the average of the squares of the errors. That is the average square difference between the estimated values and the actual values. Yeah, could be a better explanation. Uh, we might later get the uh, ChatGPT to explain it in a better way. So let's see if it actually works or not. We need also to change the front end. Well, in the front end, we already have the metric there. Um, we need to make sure it's actually taking SNR. We see SNR. Yes, MSC, yes, the capital. Wait, it's not called SNR output, is it? Doing it in a different way. Why? Can HTML span ideas in our value? Why is it different to that? ID, let me see. Okay, in the so in JavaScript, make sure we have it. Have some SNR. Yeah, they call this SNR output. Or why not just call it SNR everywhere? SNR output. Get element by ID. This will so not work. Okay. Be getting an error. A script not found, something not found. Uh, yeah, it's not even showing the error. It's the name of this thing, isn't it? Okay, so in Python, it's called SNR response data, justify response data. Then, uh, where do we get the uh, raw signals? Okay, so that should be just data raw signals. A spectrum should be the same data spectrum. As an uh, output section not being used. Uh, okay, what am I doing wrong? Uh, to the small places. Just going to assume you're using. I'm not using jQuery. Why are you assuming I'm using jQuery? I'm using element by ID. Yes, that's right. You are correct. I'm not using uh, jQuery, just using vanilla, <laughs> whatever you call it. Vanilla. JavaScript. Um, okay. Why do I need to do this anyway? It's inside. Uh, when that. Uh, 
Gitch. What's happening after when data? You know, I'm confused. Gitch showing me the values. Get HTML 7IT. Let me see, output there, that's the same. Why am I not seeing the text? Get rid of that for a sec. I comment it all out. Right, we have the numbers. Um, our main thing is how to make sure everything fits the one screen. Whether the noise is on by default. It's the color bit. Yeah, we haven't broken the inputs into three parts yet. Uh, we did all this. Make sure fits into the screen. Can you actually do it or is it too much to ask? To ensure all content fits within the screen and provides a comfortable user experience, consider the following approaches. Responsive design. Use a responsive framework like Bootstrap or apply media queries to ensure elements resize or reorganize based on screen size. Viewport. Set the viewport in the less than head greater than your HTML to make sure your website scales correctly on all devices. Uh, yes, I already have that. Overflow control. Use the CSS properties Overflow X, hidden and Overflow Y, Watto to prevent horizontal scrolling and enable vertical scrolling if the content overflows the viewport. Flexible grids. Use flexible grids that adjust based on the viewport size. This can be achieved with percentages or modern CSS like Flexbox and CSS Grid. Font size adjustments. Ensure text is legible on all screen sizes. You can use relative units like M, REM, or viewboard units, VW, VH. Okay, yeah, the other thing, uh, make sure look like outputs. Okay, I need to give me like specific suggestion. Yeah, I don't know what's the regular screen size, but still doesn't fit. So it's okay for the text to be below, but the... Uh, Everything else idea yeah, will fit into one screen. And if it's not big enough, it should adjust the size of the charts. Can you do that? It also can be displayed side by side. Let's do it again. I'll just grab the whole uh, panel. Pop it into how to improve a out making sure all inputs and outputs fit into the screen yeah hopefully it understands that uh, yeah the text can be below the provided image showcases a user interface ui with controls at the top a waveform graph in the middle and a frequency spectrum graph at the bottom to improve the layout and ensure that all elements fit comfortably within the screen consider the following suggestions Reduce padding, margins, the space between the UI elements, especially at the top, can be reduced to provide more room for content. Uh, no, I think that's okay. Group related controls together in distinct sections. For instance, wavelet denoise, gorbaches, and levels can be grouped under wavelet settings panel. And that's interestingly, but uh, that's only grouping the controls. Similarly, channel number, window size, the trend, filter order, whole spectrum, frequency scale, and scroll can be grouped under another panel like signal settings. Uh, we actually had a prompt for that. Uh, break the panel into three parts while wavelet. Okay, let's go with this. Drop down menus. If the number of options within a category grows, consider using drop down menus. This is especially useful for selections like door is one if more wavelet types are added. Yes, we're already doing that. Vertical alignment. Instead of a horizontal layout for controls, Instead of stacking some controls vertically to use vertical space more efficiently, especially if the screen's width is limited. Yeah, we generally want to have like an adaptive, adaptive uh, layout. And use adaptive layout. Yeah, that's right. Adjust the but... height of the graphs based on their importance. If the frequency spectrum graph is secondary to the waveform graph, it can be displayed with a smaller height. If the screen is wide enough 
and the EEG signal in the time domain and the frequency domain should be side by side. That's right. How did you know? That's I'm gonna <laughs> going to say that. <laughs> response design. Let's continue with this uh, response from GPT-4. Responsive design. Ensure that the UI adjusts itself based on the screen size. This is crucial for users with smaller screens or when the application is accessed on tablets or mobile devices. Don't understand. Do I have to do it like manual or can I just tell it like everything be adaptive and uh, that's it? Why do I need to check uh, the size of the screen or device? Use tabs. Type? If certain settings or views are not always needed, consider using tabs to switch between different views or settings panels. This can help declutter the main view. Um, yes, but also minimize yeah, use no. of borders. While borders help define boundaries, overusing them can create a cluttered look. Consider using subtle shadows or changes in background color to differentiate sections. Okay, now it starts giving some generic hierarchy. stuff. Ensure the primary controls or information, like the graphs, are more prominent, while secondary controls can be less emphasized. This can be achieved through size, color, or typography. Opt for modern UI components. Modern sliders, toggles, and buttons can be more compact and visually appealing, helping to enhance the overall aesthetics while saving space. Uh, that uh, could be an interesting one. And this one is for you. Feedback and testing. Lastly, collect feedback from actual users. They can provide insights on which controls they use most often, what information they need to see most prominently, and which elements can be minimized or grouped together. Yeah, this is exactly where I need your help. Remember, while optimizing space, it's essential to maintain clarity and ease of use. It's a balance between aesthetics, functionality, and user experience. Feels like it forgot the actual code, or is it not generating any code because I told it uh, not to? Can we do all four specific codes suggestions? Okay. Signal to noise ratio, SNR, and mean square error, MSE, as outputs, designate specific areas on the UI where these values will be displayed prominently. You might consider using read only input boxes or labels with a different background color or a border to differentiate them as output values. Okay, take that. And nothing have changed. Output box. I don't think I have an output box, do I? Yeah, I'll change the colors later. All right, we don't see the difference because it's an output suggesting to do this instead. Okay, you see the box, there are no values in it. What am I doing wrong? Uh, let's do F12 here, Control Shift C. Struggle shoot it straight from the browser. Okay, where is the text? Where is the text? Where's the color coming from? Uh, okay, I don't know what's going on. I don't see the numbers. Let's double check the uh, HTML. Uh, read only. The div is okay, but I mean, the whole div can be an output box. Does look better, but unfortunately, I do not see the numbers. Okay. Adapted. Let's move on. Use CSS Flexbox or Grid to create flexible layouts that adapt to screen size. Right, so this container has CSS. And do we really have it? No. Now, the other question is, we have a secondary CSS, and this one does have a container display flex, flex wrap wrap. Yeah, so we can't really do it because uh, we already have a container features uh, in the styling of the whole project. So we won't be changing it here. You want the EEG signal in the time domain and the frequency domain to appear side by side on wider screens. You can use a media query to achieve this. Uh, right, so by default, stack the charts vertically for mobile devices. Yeah, let's try it out. This should be definitely wider. Uh, that didn't work. Ah, oops. To do the whole. No, the chart is there. Okay, let's do the whole thing. 
just in case that's the problem. Uh, okay, that doesn't work, obviously. Uh, what am I doing wrong? Do we even have the chat in uh, HTML? No, we do not. A call plot container. Right. Because we need this. Assuming you're using a charting library, you would add the chart containers in your HTML and use the above CSS to style them. Down with chart. And no, that's not what I use. I use this. You should have all the previous code, I'm not sure. Why are you giving a general uh, responses? Given the provided HTML snippet and the requirements you mentioned earlier, you can modify and style the plots to fit responsively side by side on wider screens and stack on top of each other on narrow screens. Here's a suggested approach. Right, so instead of yeah, we're using plot container. Asterisk by default, set the plots to take the full width for narrow screens, asterisk. Asterisk define a media query to style for wider screens, asterisk. Uh, right, pretty sure we're doing it. Instead of that. Okay, so it's smaller screens. Will it be like this, larger screens. Will be plotted side by side. Which is nice, because we have everything feeding in. And nicely, let's see how it looks like on a mobile. What, iPhone 12 Pro? No. Don't have money for that. So we won't be testing on it as well. Is that Samsung Galaxy? Uh, not sure which size I have. I can just check on multiple ones. It's not, no, I'm just trying to make sure it's not a tablet or anything. Uh, but yes, doop. Yeah, what just happened? Uh, yeah, on mobile doesn't fit really well. On larger screen it will appear like this side by side, so it should fit. A uh, fit the entire screen. Yeah, this takes uh, too much space, doesn't it? Uh, let's restart. Right, so it does look much better. The errors we're having, yeah, no, they will be sorted in production. Yeah, the problem is smaller screen. Yeah, don't like it, takes too much space. You can remove each here. Just so it takes a bit less space. Base. Yeah, those still don't really look like outputs. The provided HTML is well structured, but to ensure our CSS works correctly, ensure the plots are within a parent container, which will help in managing the layout more. Yeah, okay, do I have this already? In HTML wrapper, no. It's not being used. So why do I need it? Clear. Both style in the last div ensures that any content below the plots will not wrap around them. This is a traditional method used after floating elements. What's that? Clear. Both style in the last div ensures that any content below the plots will not wrap around them. This is a traditional method used after floating elements. I don't know what does it mean, but I can try it out. When the browser screen width is greater than 1024px, as specified in the media query, the two plots will be displayed side by side. For narrow screens, the plots will stack on top of each other. Adjust the 1024px threshold as needed based on your design requirements. Uh, okay, if you say so, I'll keep that number because I don't have any better ideas. Uh, but what's up with... So we do have a plot container. Yeah, we don't have those titles. Have ID. So that's the same. Don't have any clearing anywhere, do we? No. We have those two plot containers. Replace the whole thing with this. Let's try that as well. Yeah, this one's still uh, not working. So yes, there's always more room for improvement. Yeah, let's assume 
the windows has got the changing yeah i don't know what to do on a smaller windows has it just doesn't fit yeah something will have to go labels could go yeah that will be hard uh leave it for now it's working okay yeah just last thing those things are still uh, let's try this again Hopefully it doesn't get upset with me because I'm asking the same thing over and over again. Yeah, I'm trying those two outputs to actually look like outputs. Let's see. Yeah, so they change, okay. Wait, the trending should be on by default. The trend on by default. Let's fix the previous thing. Yeah, I want those two outputs to actually look like outputs. HTML just two outputs is now blah blah and CSS. Let's check. Yes, and uh, right, so they just look like that. Let's keep them both for now. Let's see if I'm actually. Yeah, so those ones, where are the values? The values, the values are not there. The main problem is that this SNI is not showing any values that's the old one yeah the new one looks more like an output then where are the values they're just not there what's that says the less than output greater than tag represents the result of a calculation and is semantically appropriate here pairing each with a less than label greater than ensures clarity uh, what span ID? So we have the text output ID. It's not being shown. Yeah, I don't like all this fluff. Yeah, okay, maybe I did it. Get it. Where are the numbers? Uh, these two are not showing the actual values what the values are there what's going on to ensure that the signal to noise ratio snr and mean square error mse outputs do not show their actual values by default or until a particular action is performed you can set the default values to a placeholder like or any other string indicating that the value is not available or not calculated yet this way, users know the values are pending or not available. Uh, the values are there. Not sure what the problem is. When you fetch or calculate the actual values for SNR and MSE, you can update the outputs. However, until then, they'll show. Until the update structure function is called with actual values, the outputs will continue to display. This ensures that the placeholders are shown until you're ready to display the real values. Yeah, I'm happy to do that, but that's not going to solve the problem. Okay, can you regenerate it? Don't like this response. One, why would you do that? Why would I do that? What did I say? Ah, made a mistake. Make sure ah showing the actual values. Sorry for that. And um, yeah, no the values. Let's try again. So this one is working okay. However, is not showing the actual values. Ooh, okay, bog down in this little no things. The less than output greater than tag is designed to display the result of a calculation, but you may need to set its value using JavaScript. If you have previously been using inner HTML or text content with a less than span greater than tag, you'll have to adjust the method to work with the less than output greater than tag. When you update the values of SNR and MSE in your JavaScript code, you should be doing something similar to. With the less than output greater than tag, you need to adjust this to. The difference is in using value instead of text content or inner HTML. Yes, and just uh, output. Okay, get element by D. If you prefer using the less than span greater than tag as it was working before, but want to keep the styling of the less than output greater than element, you can use a different tag, like a less than div greater than or less than span greater than, and style it to look like an output. Okay, so will this work? And no, does not. Styled output, yet yeah, still not showing the value. It works. Okay. Okay, this one doesn't work, doesn't 
work as well. Uh, troubleshooting. Check if there is any CSS applied to output container, less than label greater than, less than output greater than, or styled output that could be hiding or misplacing the content. You can do this using browser developer tools, e.g. inspect element in Chrome. And no, there's nothing affecting this thing. Oh, come on. Ensure that there's no JavaScript that's inadvertently targeting and changing these elements. You can add a temporary inline event listener to log any changes. Be sure it's not changing. Should the save span styled output. Comment all that out. Right. So maybe it was changing or something. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, this should be an easy quick a uh, easy fix. That's working now. Moving on. Uh, trend on by default. It's suggesting to change HTML, which is easy. 